Well, first, uh, welcome to our uh, virtual and in-person uh, International Affairs Forum audience. Uh, I'm Mike Leonard. I'll be serving as your MC tonight. And uh, please take this opportunity at this time to uh, silence your cell phones because, as you may guess, Siri is AI and she is listening. <laughs> Our speaker will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, uh, please put it on the cards provided and pass it to one of our volunteers. You can remain anonymous or you can put your name on the card. If you are a student, however, we ask that you put student at the top of the card. We want to ensure that student voices and questions are heard. If you are part of our virtual audience, you can send us your questions at any point in the presentation. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I want to make an important announcement about Academic World Quest. AWQ is a program sponsored by the International Affairs Forum and Northwestern Michigan College. Its goal is to engage our local students in a national contest to foster global knowledge of events and issues that make our students informed citizens of the world. This year marked the largest event we've ever hosted. We had 93 students, 23 teams, and seven schools represented. 17 local businesses donated prizes for students. In particular, thank you to Josh and Deanna Russell, Jimmy John's owners, who have provided lunch every year that we've had this program. The human brain requires a lot of calories to power it, and Jimmy John's always comes through. So the first place team is Quiz Pro Quo of Traverse City Central High School. We are sending them to the national competition in Washington, D.C. on 19th and the 20th. Yeah. And it is through the generous donations to IAF and AWQ that this trip and our representation is possible. We hope to have them on stage here next month, just before they head off to experience our nation's capital. So over the past few years, we've received several requests to look at the global implications of artificial intelligence. We haven't ignored those requests, but we have experienced difficulty in finding the right person to address this topic. We think we found him. Joshua Meltzer is a senior fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program at the Brookings Institution. His research focuses on international economic relations and the intersection of technology and trade policy. He co-leads the Forum on Cooperation in, in, in Artificial Intelligence a multi-stakeholder multi dialogue with government officials from the US, EU, Canada, the UK, Singapore, Japan, and Australia, as well as AI experts from industry and academia. He also leads the US MCA initiative, which focuses on how the United States-Mexico-Canada agreement can strengthen the international cooperation in North America. Joshua has testified before the U.S. Congress, the U.S. International Trade Commission, and the European Parliament. He was an expert witness in the Schrems II litigation in Europe on data flows and privacy, and a consultant to the World Bank on trade and privacy matters. He is a member of the Australian government's National Data Advisory Council, as well as the Australian government's All Action Plans Committee. Meltzer leads, teaches, digital trade law at Melbourne University Law School and has taught digital trade law as an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto Law School and e-commerce and digital trade at the Diplomatic Academy of the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Before joining Brookings, he was a diplomat at the Australian Embassy in Washington, D.C., and prior to that, an international trade negotiator in Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Mr. Has, Meltzer has appeared in numerous media outlets, including The Economist, The New York Times, CNN, Bloomberg, The uh, uh, Asasi, Sahi Shumbin, and China Daily. He holds an SJD and an LLM from the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, yes, Ann Arbor, and law and commerce degrees from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, and now he can add Traverse City's International Affairs Forum to his very distinguished CV. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Joshua Meltzer to the stage. Thank you. 
and let us begin. I didn't realise that you had received my very extended um, CV, uh, so apologies for that. But I do want to say it's, a, it's a, such a pleasure um, to be back in Michigan. You know, I was reflecting as I flew up here that I actually haven't been back to Michigan since I graduated from U of M um, too many years ago. And Michigan, in fact, when I came to study at the University of Michigan, it was in fact the first time I'd ever been to the United States. Um, so, you know, I was in my late 20s at that stage and um, I didn't know what to expect and I went there to do a one-year program um, in, in the Masters of Law at the law school there and I was so, frankly, kind of blown away by the experience that I thought I needed to do anything I possibly could to spend more time at that university. So I started the PhD program with not a particular interest in PhD, um, but just wanting to be at the university longer. <laughs> and, um, you know, so that gave me that great opportunity. And then, you know, I sort of graduated and, uh, you know, was determined to come back to the United States and spend more time here and to work. And so I went back to Australia to join our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and had the good fortune of being sent back to Washington as a diplomat you know, five or six years later, and um, at the end of that stint, um, fulfilled that kind of ambition and managed to stay in uh, the US. And now, you know, 15 years later, I'm married with three beautiful American children, and, and here I am. Um, so, you know, this is very much a homecoming for me, and so go, go Wolverines, and it's great to be here. So I want to say, uh, a, a, you know, yeah, no, <laughs> great. Um, I do want to say a really big thank you to Alex for, you know, reaching out and, and making this possible and the Indonesian National Affairs Forum for, you know, their, their really warm welcome and having me here tonight. So th this is a really big topic and, um, you know, given that it's the International Affairs Forum, I am going to try to get international with this, but I do want to start a little domestically and just kind of provide a bit of an outline of what we're talking about when we talk about artificial intelligence. I will say, even before I launch into this disclaimer, I'll try to slow down. I know I've got an accent. Um, it, it's challenging. Uh, but I will try to talk about artificial intelligence, particularly sort of what's happened recently, which has captured everyone's attention with ChatGPT4 and large language models and so forth. And, you know, just briefly get into like, why does it matter? Why are we thinking about this? What does it mean for the US? And then sort of start looking at really the governance challenges for artificial intelligence. We'll have a look at what's happening here in the US, but also what the Europeans are doing. And then I want to sort of give you a bit of a sense of what's happening internationally in terms of international efforts to develop sort of cooperation and international governance mechanisms for, um, for AI. So I've got a, I am, I have, I've got a deck as you can imagine. So what, what is artificial intelligence? Well, actually there is no commonly accepted definition of AI out there at the moment, certainly not a global one. The one that tends to get used the most in the US is basically this notion of an algorithm that can make predictions or recommendations using input, which is not all that exciting or illuminating. Um, but, you know, it picks up on a couple of things, you know, particularly the notion of input. So what we've been seeing over the last 15 or so years is this capacity to gather lots and lots and lots of data. And so data is the input. So that's important as kind of the first thing to remember. The other thing that we've been experiencing for 50, 60 years now is exponential growth in our computing capacity, right? So you, I'm sure you've all heard of Moore's Law. So the power of the semiconductor doubles every 18 months, two years. This is sort of an engineering phenomenon. It's not actually a law, but, you know, in... in, in the reality of it is engineers at Intel and elsewhere have managed to essentially double semiconductor capacity every year now for 40, 50 years. Now, the thing about exponential growth is it's actually intuitively, I think, quite hard to appreciate how powerful that can be over time because we think often in very linear fashions, our world is, is fairly linear, the way we interact and navigate it is quite linear. And exponential growth, though, is also hard to appreciate in the early days of it. So if I'm going one, two, four, eight, it's still doubling, but it's doubling quite small numbers. But you do that for long enough and you start doubling very large numbers. And that's sort of what's beginning to happen with compute power. So I'll give you 
a sense. If I was to walk 30 steps in a linear fashion, one, two, three, so on and so forth, I'd probably, you know, walk across the stage and back again, maybe, in 30 steps. If I was to do 30 steps exponentially, so I did one, two, four, eight, 16, so forth, how far do you think I would go? Do you think I would go, would I get to Ann Arbor? Who thinks I'd get to Ann Arbor? Would I get to New York? I, I would get to the moon, right? That, that's the power of exponential growth and, and how unintuitive it is for how far and how big it is. And what we are living in is a world we are doubling very, very large amounts of compute capacity. If you go across the road and buy a greeting card with one of those little things that will sing to you. There's more compute power in that card that you will throw away the next day than there was in the 1950s in the world entirely, right? Um, so that's where we started out in the 1950s and today we are now um, in a place where we've got a ton of data um, because we have the internet and companies have been gathering it and the capacity to store it has become very cheap and we've got a lot of computing power. And so we're now um, producing things like what we saw emerge early last year, which is ChatGPT4, which is often referred to as a large language model or generative AI. And so what, it, what is AI? I've got this slide. I, I've, so what, what, what world are we in now? So here's, here's a slide which kind of um, gives you a sense of uh, potentially competition with humanity, competition with... Um, humans for possibly work and flourishing? Are we going to see superhuman intelligence that is going to relegate us to what monkeys are to us today? Um, is AI going to destroy us? Is it going to become the next, ex, 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 next kind of like, you know, human level extinction threat? This is, I think, the idea of it catching up to potentially climate change over time. I'm here to tell you I don't think we are anywhere near being kind of taken over by robots. I don't think we are anywhere near AI becoming conscious in the way that we think about being conscious, but we are going to be surrounded by a transformative new technology that's going to be very intelligent um, and is going to disseminate and be used broadly across everything that we come into contact over time. And so our lives will undoubtedly change and the lives of our children will very much be integrated and embedded within an AI-driven world. So let me just take a step back and get back to what OpenAI released in ChatGPT4 and why it, I think, grabbed so much attention, is that we sort of began to move from this world of AI being quite good but narrow. So you had, um, you know, AI, if you think about, again, the notion of data and output and prediction. So we had great AI, like the more data you gather about the weather, the better your predictions about weather forecasting. The more data you gather about traffic, the better is going to be your ability to, to navigate the traffic, right? Um, the more data that you grab about who's going to default on a mortgage, banks are going to be better able to assess risk from lenders. It was narrow in the sense that it became very helpful at predicting very specific tasks. Um, foundational AI, I'm going to refer to it in, in a couple of ways, but is, is or, or, or large language models are essentially more general in the sense that they have a capacity to apply their intelligence across different contexts. So you can take an AI system and you can use it in a potentially in a doctor's office, or you can use it in a classroom. Um, you can use it to write interesting articles and do some analysis. So it's it's generalizable in a way that the narrow AI systems before that were not. But it's not general purpose AI. Some of you may have heard of GP AI, um, but G general purpose AI is usually the term which is referred to as sort of generalizable sort of superhuman um, conscious AI. We're not there yet, but it's more generalizable than the narrow AI that came before it. It's also been shown that as we scale these systems, as the algorithms get more powerful, as we have a lot more data, um, the, the, the outputs actually get a, a whole lot better. Um, so th there is a really important thing about size here, which matters. And I'm going to 
come back to that because we're going to sort of have a little bit of a journey around how big this is getting and where it's actually happening and it matters when you think about this from a governance perspective. The other thing which has come along with ChatGPT4 is this notion of emergent capabilities. And to be honest, th this is there's a debate at the moment around how much this actually exists in the first place in ChatGPT4, but the basic idea is that these systems are actually throwing up capabilities that were not predicted when they were being built. And the idea is that they're essentially learning on the job, right? They're constantly, the ChatGPT4 is constantly interacting with the environment. There's this thing called self-reinforcement learning where it is essentially constantly getting feedback from the people who use it and it's improving itself as it goes. Um, so it's not only getting, only getting more accurate, but it's, being, it's doing things that the original designers did not think it would be able to do. And so this, is, this notion of emergent capabilities, I think, is really set people um, going when it comes to this idea that we're on the brink of potentially a real breakthrough in terms of moving from these sort of pre programmed intelligences into something more generalizable, more like what we um, when we think. Um, but that, that there, is a, there is a debate around that. So a, a lot of work is still going on to understand what's going on, but I think th this is a new era in artificial intelligence for sure, and it's the one that's captured, I think, everyone's imagination and attention at the moment. So, Let me move on from this. This is now, I just want to show you a couple of slides just to give you a sense of both the way that the exponential growth in AI, how it's happening both in terms of compute and in terms of cost. This is actually, um, on the left-hand side, a, a log scale. So it's making this, this would actually be a huge hockey stick if I just had this in, an, in a normal scale and it would go right off the page here. So everything's sort of a factor of 10 and, the, and these are petaflops on the left, which you don't need to sort of worry about what that is specifically, but it's simply saying that what we're seeing is that the really high-end AI models that have been released by Google, by Meta, um, by um, Microsoft and so forth are increasingly off the scale in terms of the AI compute that they're using. And I'm going to come back to that because there's a geopolitical lens to that, but the bottom line is you need lots and lots and lots of very high-end chips um, to build these models, to train the models and to keep them running. The other thing you need is you need a lot of money. Again, this is a, a, a log, this is sort of, a, this would be another hockey stick, but the figures on the left are actually to the, to the power of 10, um, so it sort of should be a log scale. So this, so the top is a million and the next one below that's 100,000 and so forth. So what you basically get to see is that the cost of training these models is also going up by a factor of 10 all the time. And so effect effectively, the world that we're in for these sort of high-end foundational AI models is one where you need lots and lots of AI compute, so you need lots of high-end semiconductors, you need lots and lots of data, and you need a lots and lots of money, capital, finance, to train these systems. So what does this mean? Partly it means that there are only a few places in the world now that are actually sort of at the leading edge of AI. Um, the US is at the front, uh, the China is somewhere behind, but China is definitely, I think, situated as, as number two. I've broken out the EU into its constituent countries where it matters in terms of AI. EU as a whole would be number three, but the key players like Germany, UK obviously not in the EU, but in Europe still, France and elsewhere, um, you know, make up the bulk of it. And then you've got a bit going on in Japan, and then it's sort of, um, you know, it, it falls away quite, quite rapidly after that. So, what, and what you would expect, I think, is that this concentration is probably going to get more extreme, not less, because if you go back to the last two slides, the costs and the, the, the need for data and the need for compute is only going up kind of logarithmically, like in this hockey stick way, and there's only so many companies or governments that are going to be situated to be able to play this game. 
So I'm just painting a picture for you here and we're going to get into some of the implications of this shortly. This is um, a graph showing you um, VC, venture capital AI investment. Uh, this actually says 2012 to 2021. It's actually, we've got now the 2023 data. But basically, uh, you see this interesting story, which is unsurprising considering where we've gone so far, which is that the US has the lion's share venture capital investment into AI startups. In fact, it's about 70 odd percent of the total there. And worth noting a couple of things. One is a quite significant decline in Chinese venture capital into AI venture capital, and also how small the share is in, in the EU27, right? I mean, it, it's about 5% or, or less or so. Of the so it's, it's about 68 billion in 2023 in, in the US, about 5 billion um, venture capital going into AI investments in Europe, and a, a little bit less than that into the UK. So the US is, you know, in many respects, kind of emerging globally as sort of a, a, a peer without peers in many respects uh, when it comes to the high end of artificial intelligence. This is also an, a world where the bulk of the investment into AI R&D is actually happening in the private sector, not in the public sector. So this is very different uh, to when you think about some of the very significant technologies that have emerged over the last 60, 70 years. A lot of it's you know, like nuclear technologies, for instance. Um, a lot of it emerged and was actually kind of supported by a lot of government R&D. And there is quite a bit of government R&D, but you can see here that the five largest tech companies, uh, Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta, Amazon, and um, are essentially spending more collectively on AI R&D than the US government is, which is incredibly significant and, and a lot more than really any, anyone else is. So this is part of the ecosystem that is sort of turning the US into really a world leader is the combination of obviously the largest economy in the world, but these mega enormous tech companies that have the data, they have the talent, which is crucial. Uh, AI talent, when it comes to the high end, is very scarce globally. Most of it is in the US. And they've got the, um, you know, the, the, the semiconductors, essentially, that they need to train it um, and the capital. to And each new model, each iteration, is only getting more and more expensive. So ChatGPT5 is already teed up and ready to go. Um, as I understand it, it's, going, it's undergoing safety tests and, and, and so forth. And, and you know, what the, 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 the cost of training ChatGPT4, which is an incredible AI system, went up tenfold just to train ChatGPT5. So what are the economic opportunities? What, why does all of this matter for us, right? So let's talk about that. I just want to touch on three things. I want to touch on broad economic opportunity. I want to touch on science briefly, and I want to touch on jobs. And then we're going to get into the governance a bit. So because this is still quite new, these are really broad-based estimates. And so I wouldn't be hanging my hat too much on the numbers specifically, but they give you a sense of the scale here. Uh, so I'm just really wanted to pull out a few figures, one by Price Waterhouse. Coupos that um, you know AI would increase global GDP by up to 14% by 2030, so an enormous number. Uh, Goldman Sachs had a look at the particular economic opportunities from uh, foundational AI, LLMs, um, generative AI, and found that it could raise global GDP by 7% and lift productivity by 1.5%. And um, McKinsey also had a look at um, how you would use generative AI across 63 use cases and found that essentially you've got sort of two and a half to four and a half trillion dollars of value there that that could unlock in that space. So enormous economic opportunity here and it really speaks to the fact that AI is a general purpose technology, right? So it's like electricity is a general purpose technology, um, telecommunications are, are somewhat like that in that they are used not just in one economic sector but throughout the economy. And this is why I was sort of talking about us being embedded in an AI world. We are at the beginning of that, but whether it is in manufacturing or agriculture or services or education or healthcare, um, it will all be essentially, you know, 
it will AI will affect all of it. Um, and so these are why the numbers get so big, because the economic opportunities are, are across the economy, they're not just in any one particular sector. Science, one of the really incredible things that AI is going to do is in part revolutionise how we do science. And I just wanted to give you this one example where um, essentially getting the 3D structure of a protein, there were about 350,000, was building blocks to bespoke medicine, right? You had to essentially map the 3D structure as the, as the starting point to start developing tailored medicine for specific diseases. It typically has taken about a PhD approximately five years and hundreds of thousand dollars to map one 3D protein. DeepMind um, has essentially mapped them all in, in a matter of months. So essentially, you think about this in terms of millions of human hours of effort and that was essentially like unnecessary because of the application of AI to this specific area of science. And so this sort of underscores that we are just going to be surrounded by a lot more intelligence. And I think, you know, the starting point generally is like more intelligence is good. Um, but what do we do with it and how do we harness it and how do we use it is the question that we are going to have to answer over time. But certainly the way that we can do scientific discoveries, development of new medicines and so forth will be deeply affected by AI and already is being affected by it. Now, the other big thing, and this sort of came, I think, from my first slide, which is what is it going to mean for us, right? What is it going to mean for humans? What is it going to mean for jobs? And You've probably heard there's a big debate going on because, like, we actually don't know the answer, right? Um, on the one hand, there is this concern that, you know, we're going to have this artificial intelligence is going to be so good that there will be no more need for humans to do work. Uh, this seems to me like a dystopian nightmare. There are some people out there who are very keen on, you know, universal kind of income and so forth, but putting that aside, you know, I don't, and, and whether or not you think that's even a good outcome, I don't think we are going to see that world transpire because of AI, and we can talk about that more. The other thing which AI is also probably more likely going to do, I think at least, is a couple of things. One is augment jobs. And this is not to say that AI is not going to deeply change the types of jobs that get done over time. They will. About 40% of the job categories that are around today did not literally exist 50 years ago. So if you go to the, 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 the Bureau of Labor and you look at the way they categorize jobs and you go back 50 years and the job categories there, there were 40% of the job categories that the Bureau of Labor actually collects data for literally didn't exist you know, 40, 50 years ago. So we have always been creating new jobs as technology comes along and new skills are required. AI, in many respects, is going to, I think, be like this. It's going to be a tool uh, that we will use that will do a couple of incredible things. Um, one of the things it's, it's AI will definitely do, which is new, is that it's going to enable us to, it, it, AI, what AI will do is make judgments, which is very new. So if you think about the computer age, the computer age was very good at automating tasks, right? You, um, so you had very specific tasks that essentially could get done by computers. And so a lot of workers who were doing, you know, skilled but repetitive tasks could be automated away. Um, and it was a big boon for sort of knowledge workers, those who worked in the domain where judgment and expertise were required uh, because you could essentially have a lot of this automated um, task being done very quickly, very efficiently, very cost effectively. And it sort of really enhanced the ability for then people to take that and to make the judgments and expertise, whether they were lawyers or doctors or architects or engineers. And th this has been a real boon. What the AI systems will do, which will be different, was that they will... They, they will not be so much about automating tasks as they will be about providing um, new levels of expertise and judgment. Somewhat actually, ironically, if you go to ChatGPT4 and you play around with it, it actually can be pretty bad at just basic facts, right? You know, there's this notion that these systems hallucinate, which is the idea that you'll prompt them with a question and they'll just get it wrong. Uh, 
there, the, the, so, so AI is sort of unlike computing in the sense that, you know, computers don't hallucinate. Computers are deadly accurate. Uh, but what AI does provide is creativity and judgment. And that, as it gets better and better, will do a couple of things. One is that it will free up people who are already in the world of making expert decisions and enhance the ability to do that. But the other thing it potentially will do is create opportunities for workers who do not typically work in the area of judgment and expertise, but give them the opportunity to do that. And I'll give you an example. Kroger's, the large supermarket chain, has got a lot of data, right? It collects data on everything that it sells and it goes in and out of its warehouses and so forth. And it essentially developed an internal um, AI algorithm which used that data to basically, you know, predict sales, to identify when advertising was having an effect and on marketing and so forth. But it required essentially, you've got a lot of data and you've got to actually build the AI models and you've got to test it with the data and you've got to then get the outputs and you've got to test the outputs with actually your real world situation. And it's quite a data intensive, laborious exercise. This is what data scientists at Kroger's did. When they built this AI system, what actually happened was that this sort of laborious process of having to sort of essentially build the basic model and, and, and put the data to it, they didn't have to do that anymore. Um, but what they could do is they could actually hire people who were not data scientists to actually build the basic models. They just had to learn how to interact with this essentially program um, to, to essentially collect the data and test it with different models. And so essentially people who were not trained to be data scientists actually started being able to work closely with data scientists in this type of setting, higher incomes, more, more kind of like skill intensive, but you didn't need to train them up to be data scientists. So this was sort of this AI actually pulling workers um, into a higher level of kind of occupational skill sets and income. And then the actual data scientists went off and what they were doing is actually testing the AI models at the very end, fine tuning them, making sure that they were actually kind of like most tied to reality. And the final thing was that they created this new category of work called insight specialists that took the outputs from the model and actually translated it into business speak for the executives so that they could help interpret the AI systems and their output and turn it into kind of actionable items that executives could then act on. So you see this multifaceted kind of impact on the job market. Okay. What else are we having? The other element that's going on at the moment is geopolitics. And this is where I'm gonna, I'm gonna toggle now between the domestic and the international a little. I think we're all familiar with the fact that the US and China are increasingly in a state of competition, geopolitical competition, and a lot of it is just centered around technology and particularly around artificial intelligence. China has essentially said that it wants to lead the world in artificial intelligence. The, um, the reason this is of concern for the US in part is because AI, as we've just been talking about, is going to have huge impacts on economic opportunity, productivity, growth. So if you want to have a world leading economy in the next 20, 30, 50 years, you need to be at the cutting edge of a whole range of technologies. Certainly AI is one of them, right? And at the end of the day, you know, the, the, if you've got a world leading economy, you've got the, you, you have a lot of like soft power in the world, you have a lot of power because you uh, attract um, trade and investment and economies underpin military capacity. So the, all this matters geopolitically. And China also, a lot of these technologies are what's called dual purpose. So a lot of the technologies that are being developed for the civilian commercial side also have applications in the military space. And this is another reason why the race over AI matters so much between countries, because if you want to have a world leading military, then you need world leading AI, you need to integrate it into your forces and your decision making and so forth. So, um, who leads in AI has become quite central to the geopolitical competition. Now, as I said before, you need a lot of chips. And not only do you need chips, you need really high-end chips. You need like chips at the seven nanometer, five nanometer level. And most of the chips get made by the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation in Taiwan. So the US used to make a lot of chips, Intel. But what actually happened was chip 
fabrication became fairly essentially routinized. And so the US focused a lot more on the high-end design of the chips and a lot of the actual manufacturing went to Asia. And that was fine as an economic model until the US-China tensions rose and suddenly it became clear that without fabrication capacity in the United States, um, there was a real risk that in the event of a cross-strait war or a blockade around Taiwan that China might do, any, without, you could, if you lost access to a couple of fab facilities on the other side of the world, the US would be at, at a serious shortage of chips with huge economic um, ramifications. So there's a couple of things that then are going on in the US now, right? We are, we are stopping the export of semiconductors to China. It's basically, um, it's certainly the high-end chips. So uh, we're not quite stopping, uh, we're, not, we're, we're a lot less concerned about this. So the, the chips that you get in your cars and in your refrigerators, we're not that concerned about at the moment. But the high-end chips, the design, the technology that goes into making them, um, if you are a company in the United States, but if you are also TSMC or you are a fab facility in Korea and you're using US technology now to make these high-end chips, you cannot sell that to China. And most of the technology to make these high-end chips comes from the US and a couple of other places. ASML in Holland makes these high-end lithography machines, which is essentially the machines that use like protons to essentially burn the, um, the wafers onto the chips to actually create the, the semiconductors. So there's technology in Germany and Holland and Japan that's also um, needed to make these high-end chips. And they're all essentially getting on board with these export controls. So we're trying to stop China getting access to high-end chips, right? And a big part of this is to slow down their move to the cutting edge of AI. And the other thing that we're doing through the Chips and Science Acts, which the Biden administration passed, is build a fab capacity in the US, and that's kind of underway at the moment. So a lot of, um, when we think about how do we develop AI, how do we govern it, we always have to keep in mind that we are in a competition with China about this, and so we want to get it right, and we're constantly going to have to balance between making AI safe, but also not slowing down innovation too much, right? Okay, so what's happening? So this is a sense of governance. Last year was a really big year for AI governance, and this is basically a big term for efforts in a whole range of countries and areas around the world to put in place rules, regulations, and, and other kind of elements around what AI can and can't do. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different things out there. I'm not going to go into everything here in detail, but there's a mix of legislation, strategy, AI standards, um, these so-called safety institutes, which have really started being developed recently to get at AI risks, and also building out the access to the infrastructure, the public AI compute and the data so that there is more access by researchers and students and small businesses to develop and use AI as well. What I want to do is focus a little on what's going on in the US and, and in the EU. So the US um, has, done a, has been doing a lot, actually, and, and this has been going on for a number of years now. And I want to just pull out a couple of, I think, key more, most recent developments. The AI Safety Institute is actually very new, um, and it's essentially going to get at, like, high-end AI risks. So AI can potentially produce a lot of risks, right? Um, if you use an AI in a mortgage, uh, you know, if you're at a bank and you're using AI to help you assess mortgages, right? If, you do, if your data is, it, 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 depending on the data that you use, you can end up with AI systems that are discriminatory, um, that are biased, uh, that produce unfair outcomes. Uh, the bottom line is if, you have, if you're collecting data from a population and, and the data is, is biased or discriminatory, then the outcomes are going to be biased and discriminatory. So there's a whole lot of work around data governance. How do you try to make sure that the data sets are representative, that they're fair, that they're not um, picking up on historical biases or discrimination? I mean, the, the, one of the earlier versions of ChatGPT4, if you, if you ask them, you know, questions about, you know, who's a doctor, who's a nurse, they would throw out women or men, right? I mean, like, or, or, or black or white or, you know, so a lot of these kind of like discriminations are trying to be kind of resolved through that. The executive order on AI came out in October 2023, and um, essentially that did two things. That it basically said to all federal US government agencies, you need to work out how you're going to use AI in your 
agencies, so everything from you know nuclear to energy to housing to health to education, you need to train your workforce and we're going to provide a budget to do that. And you need to set standards to ensure that the AI that you use is safe and, and fair. The other thing that they're doing through the AI order, which is going to be quite significant, is using essentially the federal government's government procurement capacity um, to essentially dr drive standards and safe and responsible AI outcomes in the private sector, because if you want to bid for a government contract to provide an AI system, you'll have to comply with those standards. So that is, was quite a significant development. The other piece is these White House voluntary AI commitments which were made in September last year with the six or seven largest tech companies. And they basically came forward and agreed at the White House that when it comes to these very high-end foundational AI models, that they would uh, do a couple of things. They would red team them, which means that when you sort of test them, you do adversarial testing to actually see how they respond. They would report on the outcomes of the red teaming. They would sort of be more, a lot more transparent on the kind of the way that they were dealing with the risks associated with these models. And the National Institute of Science and um, Technology, NIST, has produced a risk management framework for businesses to help them set up the internal procedures to essentially manage AI risks and so forth. So there's been quite a bit happening at the federal level. What has not been happening is we do not yet have federal privacy legislation, which is important irrespective, I think, of AI, but becomes even more important because AI increases the capacity to essentially identify people. And so federal privacy legislation is an important part of developing a governance space. And we don't just, and a lot of this is, is, is through, the exec, through, the, through the White House, through executive orders. We haven't actually legislated on some of these things. And that may come at some point. There's been a lot of work in Congress on that, but that's where the US is at at the moment. Uh, the EU has been developing an AI Act for a number of years now, and this is actually very timely because effectively it passed last week. Um, I won't go through, like, the, you know, it goes through the Council and the European Parliament and the European Commission and there's a trilogue. It's essentially done. It's going to get phased in over the next sort of six months to three years. The EU has taken a very different approach to the US. So the US is essentially still saying to companies, the basic US approach is we want to, we're, we're leading AI, we want to encourage innovation, but we want to make sure it's safe and responsible. Um, there's a lot of, we're going to try to put out the guidelines and principles and standards around what we think ethical and safe AI is, grounded in kind of notions of US civil rights. And we are though going to leave it up to companies to essentially monitor and make sure that they comply. And we may, there may be at some point we'll introduce more stiffer penalties and more um, compliance. But the EU's gone a very different route and they've essentially said we're, we're going to put in a, a top-down sort of omnibus kind of legislation. We've, set, we've basically set standards for a risk-based approach to AI. Um, for high risk and low risk AI, they separate it out with all these different responsibilities that go along with it. So quite different approaches, one a lot more regulatory, one a lot less so, and the EU's got very significant fines that follow it. Now, why do we then, I want to now move from what the US and the EU is doing to what's happening internationally, and why do we need to worry about international AI governance? So a couple of key reasons here. One is this is a global technology. Right? And, and it should be a global technology. The bottom line is if, if, if we do not get the rest of the world to using AI, we're going to create a huge gap economically between the developed and developing world. I mean, there already is obviously a very large gap. The risk is that this gap gets even larger if there are not genuine kind of pathways to enable developing countries to use artificial intelligence. It's also true that the way that countries regulate domestically is going to matter internationally. Right, so essentially the EU's approach means that if you now want to be in the EU market, you have to follow the EU laws and regulations, right? Um, other countries may then follow the EU approach and, um, and so forth. So there are going to be different kind of international spillover effects from the domestic regulation and we want to cooperate to kind of manage those effects and make sure they're not costly. The other thing we want to do is we want to try to get some common sense of what do we mean by ethical AI. Uh, there's been a lot of work going on to try to set up common global standards and principles around what we mean by ethical AI, and there's been quite a bit of progress there. But essentially, you know, particularly amongst Western democracies, uh, a lot of this is not just a technology that's value neutral. It's going to be deeply 
um, value intensive, right? How, how, what do we mean by di a discriminatory outcome? What do we mean by AI that's fair? What do we, how do we balance AI risk and innovation are all value judgments. And so trying to align on that will mean more effective regulation and more effective ethical AI outcomes. And finally, there's geopolitics, right? And, you know, China is obviously like an autocracy and it's going to have a different set of values that it is going to embed into the AI that it develops and disseminates. And so part of the thinking about how we think about how AI is disseminated globally is you want to get common alignment as much as possible amongst the main sort of large democratic countries. So here you see there's been quite a bit of work going on, some in the UN, some in the OECD, the, 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 in, in Paris, uh, the G20, the grouping of the 20 largest economies. The G20 has not really been able to do all that much because China and Russia are in that group and obviously no one likes Russia at the moment and it's difficult to get agreement with China on much to do with AI. So the G7, which is that typical you know, developed country grouping with the US, Canada and Europe, um, has actually done a lot on AI, as you can see here, in terms of principles and codes of conduct and standards. Uh, the TTC is the Trade and Technology Council, which is a bilateral US-EU arrangement that the Biden administration set up. And that's sort of been, I think, really key to the way that the US... I, I think the Biden administration essentially came into office and said, we need to cooperate a lot more deeply with the EU, um, in part because they are a big economy and they are a close you know, partner with similar values and we need them on board if we are going to effectively address our challenges with China. And so the TTC has been an attempt to really try to get the, to align the US and the EU on various technology issues, including around AI. And international standards bodies, um, I'll, I'll skip over GPI for the moment, are also an area which matter a lot because uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the role that just standards play in creating interoperability amongst technology and products. This will be crucial for artificial intelligence. And so there's a lot of work going on in standards bodies to try to develop common approaches to risk and risk management and so forth. Um, a lot of the groupings of the countries, it's kind of random at the moment. So some are in, some are out. Um, it's, 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 it's messy is kind of the, me the message I, um, I want to get across to you. And the point I want to make here, I'm, I'm not actually going to run through this um, really quickly now because there's a lot of information here, but the point I want to make is we actually don't have a forum that is really ideal for international cooperation on AI. We've, we've essentially got these multitude of forums, the G7, the G20, some bilateral forum, the OECD, but they don't have either the right mix of countries. The G7's only got seven, so it's really, it's good, but it's too small. The G20's got China, so we can only go so fast. The UN, it's multilateral, it's got everyone, so that's good, but then that means we're really gonna go slowly. Um, the US dominates in some of this stuff, so what does that mean when you talk about international cooperation and so forth. So what does this mean? Um, what's next for international AI governance? So we have a couple of options here. One is we basically take what we've got and we just improve it. So we maybe take the G7, add a couple of countries, Australia, um, and so forth, and, and go from there. Some There's been quite a conversation around we need a new international body, right? So some there's like analogies drawn between we need an IPCC for AI, right? The IPCC, which gets con scientific consensus on climate change. Some say we should have that for AI, like to get scientific consensus on where we are at. Or we need something like the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which governs nuclear technology. We need something like that for AI. Or CERN, which is the big sort of scientific collaboration in Europe around semi-particle semi physics, we could do that for AI, or maybe something like the Financial Stability Board, which sort of does research and monitoring of financial risks globally. The problem is, like, AI is unlike any other technology. So these analogies are helpful, but they only take us so far. Um, because it's dual use and um, it's got these military and commercial, um, it's a bit like nuclear, which is obviously dual, dual use. Um, 
but um, you know, it's, it, it challenges the IPCC model in part because it's so much of the research is done commercially by companies, and so you, you need access essentially to commer very commercially confidential information to really have any way of understanding what the cutting edge is. Because there's so much private sector R&D, it's not clear like a CERN model is necessarily optimal. Um, it's general purpose, so it's kind of unlike nuclear, which is a, just a single technology with some very specific applications. It's widely available. Um, a lot of it's open source still, so it's very hard to lock it down and kind of control it like we do with nuclear. And we also need to account that it is developing rapidly and we have geopolitics layered on top of that where we have to think about how do we remain at the leading edge while also regulating it effectively. So no answers there but I think this is kind of like the space that everyone's thinking about in terms of AI governance. Um, let me stop there and um, hand it off to Q&A. Thank you. All right. Um, so, as we have done in the past, uh, please hand your questions to Alex, who will be taking them. We'll also be taking questions off uh, online, but what I would like to do is begin with a question here. Um, Joshua, this week, 52 nations who are signatories to the Political Declaration on Responsible Military Use of Artificial Intelligence and Autonomy met in Washington for the first time. Notably, uh, China and Russia weren't part of it, but what sort of outcomes can we look for from this group? So I, I will say up front that I'm not um, really deep into the military applications of AI. We have been doing uh, some work at Brookings as well on a track, di track 1.5 dialogue with China on AI. I think the, so there's, there's the, the key thing when it comes to AI in the military is that you don't want AI taking over your command and control systems, particularly when it comes to nuclear weapons. And, and that, so you, you want, you always want to have a human in the loop, right? Which is sort of the terminology, which is self-explanatory in that you don't want these decisions to be automated and done by an AI system. And I think the view is the US and China should be able to agree on this. This should be in everyone's common interest. So this is really the focus um, at the moment, is trying to get a common kind of ground on not putting AI or doing it in a way where you've always got a human in the loop. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Sarah Hartley. Uh, an online uh, viewer, is there a point at which our physical resources, meaning rare elements, water, et cetera, will no longer support the demands of exponential AI growth? Yeah, it, it, so AI is definitely energy intensive, and that's one of the um, areas that is um, you know, increasingly important when one thinks about where do you locate these um, facilities for both running the sort of centres that train the AI um, as well as the energy needed actually to produce the, the chips. So you may have noticed that some of the new chip fabs are going into Arizona. There's a bunch of reasons for that. Some of it is they've, they've had a great program there training engineering talent there for a while. But part of it is they're going to build a, a, a ton of renewable energy uh, capacity in, in there as well. So this is, I think, a bigger part of sort of the transition to cleaner renewable energy. Okay, thank you. Now, this we have a question that uh, they're both very similar. One of them is from a student, and uh, one of them is from Karen Siegel. And they're actually pretty much the same question. Uh, so I'm going to read the students, Karen, uh, even though yours is very well worded as well. Uh, do you think chat GPT-4 should be considered a tool that can be used in schools? It's, um, uh, yeah, so, we, we actually at, at Brookings have gone through this internal process trying to work out, you know, some guidance and rules around using ChatGPT4. And so it's been something that I think all education-focused institutions are grappling with. My sense of the reality is that people are going to be using it um, irrespective. So you need to work out how do you use it given that it's going to be used by students, it's going to be used by researchers. And so then there's, I think, a couple of ways of thinking about it. One is 
what does it mean for testing, right? If you can go into a chat GPT form prompt and get an essay, um, like how do you distinguish that from an essay that hasn't been done using chat GPT before? Do we need to think about new ways of assessing students going forward? Um, I think these are going to be very challenging questions. So we, I, I don't think it's a question, and then I think there's going to be a, a secondary question which is still a little way off, but actually as a teaching aid. Um, in schools as well. And, and there I think the potential is very significant. Khan Academy, which is the big online provider of courses, has actually been working with OpenAI for a year or so now to actually build um, essentially generative AI into its offerings. And so there's a whole range of opportunity here to really extend access to education in, 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 in big and important ways. Um, so I, th I think there's a lot of opportunity, but I think it's going to be really challenging. Thank you, Joshua. Now this next question, what are the implications for AI in the United States relative to the election this November? And I think you know which election we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, you know, I think we're all somewhat concerned um, broadly about the election, but so there's been misinformation online as a result of social media, obviously, for a decade or more, and in many respects, the risks from AI are not new in that sense, uh, and I think we're getting a, bit, a better handle on what the risks from misinformation are. AI, ChatGPT, can certainly make it a more risky environment, particularly if it's used to effectively create deep fakes, where you essentially have videos online of leading politicians. You can imagine, you know, whether it's Trump. And you know, saying things that is, you know, you you would not be able to know that that is not them, and by the time it maybe gets taken down, the damage has been done. The the leading um, AI companies are actually saying now they're going to watermark uh, their, their 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 video so that you will know um, if it's actually generated by an AI system. But there is a lot of attention to this, but certainly concerning. Um. This next question actually is something we've all experienced, and uh, AI is used in a number of areas to save manpower, such as self-checkout lanes. Some customers love it, some don't. And recently, Walmart, Dollar General, and Target all announced that they'll be returning to human cashiers uh, because of shrinkage and customer dissatisfaction. What's your reaction? Good. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've always wondered, like, why I'm not being paid to check out. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I think there are going to be business decisions that are going to have n nothing um, to do with AI. So, I, I mean, I, I don't have much to add to that. I, but I think, you know, I mean, AI will potentially be part of the retail solution in different ways, but I, I don't know how that will play out going forward. Okay. Um, this is from another uh, student, and uh, it's just essentially what, uh, you know, all technology has a, you know, positive and negative aspects to it, but what are the dangers that particularly our younger folks should be really worried about in terms of artificial intelligence? What should keep us, keep us up at night? You know, I... I I think that there's every reason um, for students in the US to be primarily optimistic um, about the AI opportunity. It's just going to require, I think, thinking smartly and creatively about what that will mean for their careers and working lives going forward. Things will change and probably change quite rapidly, but as I said before, I think there's a good argument to be made that this is going to be another tool that will actually mean, which, which, which we will use more effectively to do better things faster and we can't even imagine the types of jobs that are going to come along that you know, AI will need. So I think it's an exciting opportunity, but I think it's, it requires a, a flexible potential rethink about what careers are going to look like. Okay, um, we have time for two more questions. We're going to take one from our online audience and then finish up with this last question. From our online audience, in this country where neither our Congress nor our Senate seem to demonstrate a great deal of literacy in technology, what is the likelihood of developing good legislation? Yeah, I mean, the, the Congress has been, it's a cartoon show um, 
when it, when it comes to technology. It's, it's not to say that they can't learn <laughs> themselves gradually and the staffers who are in the offices who are really writing the legislation, there are some really good people there and they're getting better at it. So I think Congress might be able to catch up over time. The White House is increasingly well staffed with, with AI, AI expertise, but this is a, is a problem. Um, I don't hold out hope for much um, intelligent AI legislation coming out of Congress for a while, but I can imagine a future where that is possible, but I think the short term looks bleak, for sure. Okay, students, some of you have a place in Congress. All right, uh, the last question, Joshua. Are you optimistic about the U.S. and China finding a common ground for cooperation on IA, or are we headed for a winners-take-all type battle? Yeah, I, actually, this is... Uh, I teach a, a, an online course. There's a postcard out the front. We've got a whole lot of great public policy courses online if you're interested, um, so grab that, because what, this is one of the issues where there's one coming up by this woman, Sam Sachs, who's at Yale, um, or China's Digital Governance, and she gets into this in, in a whole lot of detail. Um, I, I, I'm not optimistic. I, I think that the US and China are in, you know, barring a, a major political realignment in, in China, I think the US and China are in, are in sort of for a long-term um, set of tensions and conflict with the kind of ultimate goal being managing that so it doesn't turn into a hot war. I think that would be the worst of, worst, worst, worst of, of all possible outcomes. Um, finding opportunities, you know, for cooperation where they can. This is sort of Jake Sullivan's formula, essentially. But, um, you know, being realistic that we're not going to go back to what it was in the, in the early part of the 21st century where we had, like, deep levels of cooperation. I think increasingly we're going to see the economies sort of separate out in various ways. Um, and I think the tensions will remain there for quite a while. All right, well, before we thank Joshua, uh, it's my job to tell you a little bit about what's coming up next. Uh, our re next regular event will be the equivalent of a double feature. This area, as you all know, is truly blessed with an abundance of fresh water. And that isn't the case for much of the world. So IAF is gonna present two back-to-back -back programs. The first will be on the 17th of April when we will present the documentary film Relentless and a panel discussion after the screening. Relentless was written, directed, and produced by IAF Advisory Board member Lindsay Haskin. Lindsay worked for five years with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission to tell the story of the destruction of the Great Lakes fishery by the invasive sea lamprey in the 1950s, the work of dedicated scientists to find a way to control the sea lamprey and the recovery of the fishery that we enjoy today. It's a good news story of dedication, science, and cooperation, and narrated by Oscar winner J.K. Simmons. It will be shown here in the Millican Auditorium. This documentary is receiving a lot of positive international attention. Lindsay is offering it to this community free, and we are passing it on in the same manner. This is a kid-friendly event because we plan to have some live sea lampreys and a chance to interview scientists and environmentalists after the film. Lindsay will be on hand to tell us how he made the film. The following evening, on the 18th of April, Peter Annan, director of the Mary Giggs Burke Center for Freshwater Innovation and the author of Great Lakes Water Wars and Purified and How Recycled Sewage is Transforming Our Water will continue our theme of optimism and solutions to talk about how nations can work together to protect this most precious resource for generations to come. And don't miss the reception then from 5.30 to 7 on April 18th, our event partners from NMC's Great Lakes Water Studies Institute and the Points North podcast team from Interlochen Public Radio are going to offer brief presentations in the museum gallery to help us learn about their impactful work in our freshwater backyard. This event uh, is brought to us through a grant from the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, Miigwech. So we hope our presentation was useful tonight and reflects our purpose to educate both citizens and su uh, students of this great part of the globe we live in. If you're already a member, thank you for your support. If not, it is simple and easy to join through the TCIAF.com website. Now, join me in thanking Joshua for a stimulating and exciting presentation. Great job. 
Great job, my friend. Okay, until next time, go forth and do great things.